Okay, so welcome back uh, to the afternoon session. And we have one talk in this session by uh, A.V. Paulson, and he will also continue tomorrow. And today he's going to uh, talk about distance problems and uh, their variance. So over to you. Thank you, sir. So everyone hear me well in the back there? Yeah. Okay, good. So first of all, thank you, Saurabh and Yatsarabh for the invitation and ICTS for the hospitality, been wonderful. Um, the two talks, I'm gonna tell you about stories that have their origin in a discrete setting. So connects a little bit to the discrete theme, but we're gonna go into a continuous setting, see some harmonic analysis and interplay between harmonic analysis and geometric measure theory. Today, I'm mostly gonna focus on some sort of known things focus on uh, simple configuration, that of distance and questions related to that one, try to sort of build the foundations. Tomorrow I'll go to more complicated configurations that may perhaps be of more interest to some of the experts in the audience, uh, but the two sort of will be related through that. So just to set the scene, then the questions that we're interested in here are about basically patterns and point sets. So if you throw down points in the plane, what, what kind of patterns can you see there? Of course, this is uh, conceptually the goal of much of mathematics and many different branches of mathematics. So the particular type of a question that I have in mind here is to look at distances. Uh, we're looking at distances and I wanted to give you like a very sort of concrete example. Like what if I just put four points in the plane and I chose them very well here. One thing you can do is you can compute all the distances between them. So if you start with four points, you have four choose two pairs, you can compute all distances and you end up with a list of numbers. And one of the questions you could ask is, well, how does this relate to the points? It, is there some relation? Does it classify it somehow? Now, some of these things are used for lattices in the sciences that people record them through distances and how often they appear. Uh, but here, the question I'm going to look at, one can ask many questions about this list, uh, but the question I'm going to ask is how many different numbers show up here? How many distinct distances are there? Now, for those of you who were here Friday and saw perhaps Malabika's talk, she hinted at a different question also, the one that asks, how often does, does the most popular distance arise or the Erdős unit distance problem? And so, as you can see, there are many questions you can ask. You can ask about the distribution and whatnot, but we're going to ask about the simplest one, distinct distances. Now, just looking at this, okay, we got the number four, and you might ask, well, is that generic? What can happen? And if you just start messing around with this simple example, you can see that, well, you can change the outcome based on where you place the points. For example, if I were to wiggle the point here, one zero, a little bit off, I would see that all six distances that I would record would be different. Whereas if I wanted to make it more symmetric and I brought the point two comma two down to one comma one and I would have the square, it would only be a two. So clearly the question, how many distinct distances, uh, is not well posed if you just say, I have four points in the plane. It's specific to how they're configured. But you can still ask, can I bound it? Can I put upper bounds, lower bounds, and so forth? And that is where our journey starts. It's easy to have many distinct distances. If you just take n points and throw them in the plane randomly, well, you still have the n choose two pairs, which I'm going to say is of order n squared. I know it doesn't equal n squared, but we're think, going to be thinking about n going large. So I don't care about lower order terms. I don't care about constants out front. It's just order of magnitude growth n squared. And with probability one, no distance will repeat. So you will have, in fact, about the most you can. So it's really easy to generate this. But then the, one of Erdős's genius was to identify that then the question is, how low can you go? So the question is, what is the least number of distinct distances determined by endpoints in the plane? And if you start playing along, start with three points, and you realize, well, I can set them in an equilateral triangle. That is only one distance. Well, we saw the example with four points there, and no matter how hard you try or in how smart you try to place them, you will see that you can do no better than two. And as you add more points, 
this lower bound grows. And the question is, how fast does it grow? Will it grow like n squared, like the upper bound, will it grow slower? What's happening? Now, by looking at the integer lattice, and so let's think for a moment that n is a perfect square. So you can talk about a root n by root n lattice where all the points have integer coordinates. You can start counting distances and it's far easier to count distances squared. So we'll do that. And so you have the unit distance squared, which is one, root two squared, which is two. And then you realize when you count the distances in this lattice, that the furthest you can go is diagonally opposite which is root squared, root n squared plus root n squared, which is order two n, right? So immediately just from the simple observation about what the form of the distance is squared is, you can see that there are no more than n, which is far less than the n squared if we threw them randomly down in the plane. I always pause here because people should call me out and ask, okay, well, where is the three? How are you gonna write three? And there are holes in this list. And so there's actually number theory here. And if we had been in the other hall, then I would have said Lando Ramanujan, but I'll still say it, but like appropriate still, right venue. Uh, and so if you account for the holes, then you get asymptotically about N over square root log N. That's sort of the asymptotic count that you will have. And Eridor said, well, things are not gonna get more regular than this in the limit. And so the conjecture is, this is the least number of distinct distances asymptotically as n is going to infinity up to constants uh, that you should get. And so this is the famous Eridor distinct distance problem trying to prove that, okay? So we have the construction on one hand, but of course the tricky thing is, in order to try to prove that this is the, the lowest you can go, you are handed a set of n points and you must prove that they have at least these many distinct distances. These are just some n points. You have no structure to work. So how do you do this? Okay. So one clever observation is to note that circles in the plane, spheres in higher dimensions encode distances. As in, if I fix a point here, and then I look at points that lie on circles around it. Like if I have like the blue circle, I have like two points on the blue circle while well, they're at the same distance, okay? So somehow circles encode distances. And Erdős took this observation, paired it with the fact that two circles in the plane intersect in the most two points and was able to obtain a lower bound of root n for any set in the plane of n points that must have at least root n distinct distances. Now, granted, this is far field. So if we think about n over square root log n here, we're down here with root n, and we're trying to pass up, okay? And so Malbik actually on Friday did this example very well. So I'm not gonna go through the calculations. It's a beautiful, beautiful proof, okay? But then through the decades, many, many great contributions to this, including amazing mathematicians like Samaretti and whatnot. But to make a long story short, uh, then Guth and Katz, in a paper that appeared in 2015, obtained n over log n, so it has the right power of n. I know someone is always gonna complain that it doesn't have the square root here. Yes, that's a slight thing that is open, but really they solved the problem and got the n over log n, right kind of a growth. Well, that's amazing, okay? Um, Malabika hinted on Friday at some of the tools that are used in these various things. There's graph theory, there's incidence theory. It's a lot of heavy duty stuff. Um, but I'm not gonna go too much into that. Now, this may disappoint you because this is one problem off the block, but I have good news. Uh, if you go into higher dimensions through the same kind of construction that we had, like if you're in 3D, you have n points, imagine n is a perfect cube, put them in a cubic root of n by cubic root of n by cubic root of n thing. You do exactly the same thing. The furthest you can go is about n to the two thirds. And you can see that generally you're gonna get n to the two over d. And because if you go in a high enough dimension, there are gonna be no holes like we had in 2D. So there are no logarithms, no number theory tripping us up here. Okay. And this is open. Now, the best, bounds are due to Solomon Vu, like Malabika mentioned on Friday. Uh, and so just to give an idea of the gap, then for example, in 3D, the conjecture is n to the two thirds, whereas the best result is around 0.6. So it's off by a little bit. Uh, the difference gets smaller, the higher the dimension. 
Uh, but yeah, so now we have an open problem. So if someone gets bored, this you could try. But I warn you, it's hard. Uh, okay. So this is the Erdős distance problem. So when Erdős looked back, so 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 this is around like 1945-ish uh, when this is happening. Uh, around Erdős's 80th birthday, he was asked to sort of look back on his career, write about his different contributions to various fields, and reflecting back, he said that he thought this was his most striking contribution to geometry. I like that he qualifies to geometry because clearly he contributed in a lot of different areas. But in geometry, this was the thing that he was the proudest of. And I can kind of see that to me, this question is like the tip of an iceberg. There's like a whole ecosystem of amazing questions that have sort of come from this. This is perhaps the poster child, but the Erdős unit distance problem, for example, is absolutely amazing and hard. Um, and I'm going to continue in slightly different directions. I'm going to go more towards the continuous theory that relates to this. Okay. So to start setting up our language, then for a set E, say an RD, then I'm going to denote D of E by D of E the distance set. And really what it is, it's just taking the distances between all the points that we have. Now, unlike the on the first example slide that I gave where I listed out all the distances with repetitions, then I'll point out that set notation does not care for repetition. So really, truly, this is encoding the distinct distances that you have. And so if we now rephrase what Guth and Katz did, then they really showed that for any subset of the plane that has n points, then asymptotically as n goes to infinity, you are bounded below the count of the distinct distances is bounded below by n over log n, up to constants and things like that. So what my squiggle is like I'm sweeping constants under the rug, but they will not depend on n, they may depend on, well, here, yeah, may depend on other things, okay? But I'm trying to push towards the continuous theory, so I would like E to be infinite. And then, although the problem is not resolved in higher dimensions, then the lower bounds still grow with N. And so if you take a limit as N go to, goes to infinity, you are just guaranteed that you are going to have infinitely many distances. So it's kind of like a not a fun question. Well, infinitely many points, infinitely many distances. Ta-da, done. Okay. Sad. But the dichotomy should somehow be that if the set that you started with is large, the distance set should be large. And I'm throwing in sort of, you haven't, we haven't really seen evidence of this yet, but it might have further structure and it might not just be large. Okay. And so the question then becomes how do we try to extract this? Uh, and there's this and just first step. We can look at this theorem of Steinhaus that if you start with a set that is Lebesgue measurable, of positive measure, then Steinhaus showed that the different set contained a neighborhood of the origin. I mean, maybe initially stated just on the real line, but really easily generalizes to higher dimensions. And as soon as this, and, and, and of course, distance is really, they're just an image of this set, right? So if this set contains a whole neighborhood of the origin, if you look at the distances, then immediately you see that not only the Lebesgue measure of the distance set is positive, but contains a whole interval. And this is of course, one of the starting points for Malabika's talk about her work with Rani. So that was kind of cool, okay? Now, even here, there are interesting open questions. So, uh, so what, what's his name again? Uh, Boardman, he had that result that said something along the lines that if you know something about how big this is, there ex one can show that there exists a universal interval that is uh, in this distance set or even maybe in the different set originally. Uh, it, it depends a little bit on the measure on this, but. If it's really large, it doesn't really take that into account. What happens if it's kind of small? And so there really are interesting questions here about quantifying like how big is this interval or how big is this neighborhood depending on the set E beyond that sort of universal result. So very cool, interesting questions already just at this point. 
Okay. But then if you think about it, I said I was going to go to sets that are large. And if we're thinking about Lebesgue measurable sets in RD, and I've already showed you that any single one that is positive Lebesgue measure uh, has then positive Lebesgue measure has an interval. I mean, the, the, these are big distance sets, right? <laughs> and well, usually when we do analysis, right, we, we sweep under the rug uh, sets that are measure zero. That's all that there is left. Okay, uh, but one could still try. One, one could ask, can I somehow relax this a little bit? What if I look at sets that have zero Lebesgue measure? Well, I somehow need to quantify their size. I might do that in dimension. Can I lower this, say, if I have a threshold so of a certain dimension, can I still recreate these types of results, either positive Lebesgue measure, containing an interval, or even both? Okay, so that's the question that I have here, the Falconer distance problem, sort of the standard way of phrasing it, which asks, how large does the house or dimension of a subset of RD need to be to ensure that the Lebesgue measure of the distance set is positive? And so we're about this Lebesgue measure of the distance set being positive. Like I told you that the dichotomy was that the distance set should somehow be large. Using the Lebesgue measure to measure that it's a very crude way. It's kind of either it is positive or it is not, right? And you may say, well, maybe there should be smarter ways of doing it. For example, quantifying how large it is, like what is the number? Or you could say, well, maybe positive Lebesgue measure is too much. Maybe you should be asking how big is the dimension of it? And I'll say that people have worked on these types of things. For example, in particular for the question where you try to quantify the dimension of the set. Uh, then amazing result by Schmerkin and Wong that have done amazing work there. Um, but I'm, is there a question? Sorry, okay. But I'm gonna focus on uh, this type of a question. For now, I'm not gonna really deal with dimension. I'm just gonna focus on Lebesgue measure and whether there's more structure, for example, containing uh, an interval. Can you look at this? And one thing you may note, so I said for Steinhaus, Steinhaus works, I mean, the original proof is a dimension one, works in any dimension. And already in here, you can see I threw in a restriction. I put D bigger or equal to two. You might be like, oh, what's happening there? And so in on the real line, you can in fact construct a set that has full dimension, yet the distance set has measure zero. And really this is, just a digit restriction type of a thing, similar to a cantor type of a construction, but a little bit harder. You've got to build it up, uh, but quite doable with a little bit of measure theory. Okay, not particularly challenging. Okay, that might seem devastating because, well, the generalization of Steinhaus, the just the original initial thing failed. And then you hang on there for a second, and then you realize that the Erdős problem, well, we started with the plane there, and then I went into higher dimension. I never really addressed 1D. So I'm gonna leave that as an exercise for you to think about what happens if you take endpoints and put them on the line, okay? And so maybe one shouldn't expect that this should be an interesting question. Moving on, if we, and so from now on, I probably am not gonna write ever again that D is bigger than two, but it will be every single time. I'm not gonna deal with 1D. Okay, so, yes? How about the cost of dimension of the distance set in this example? In, oh, in that one. Um, it might be getting close to full. So I, that I do not remember. That, that, that I would have to look up. Yeah, uh, one could quantify that, yes. Yeah, it is not as bad as that, the Hauser dimension is zero or something. It, it, it does, it is of significant size in some sense, yes. Okay, but coming back here, okay, what happens in the plane? Well, if you have realized that this is sort of motivated by a sort of Erdős's question, etc., you might go, well, maybe I should try to use the lattice to build sharpness examples. And then you go, AV, that's the dumbest thing you've said because the lattice has dimension zero, it doesn't even have a positive Lebesgue measure, what are you doing? And so the true construction is something along the following lines that if you start say with endpoints, what you do is that you place balls around them that have radius that uh, depends on the number of points that you have. You scale it down into the unit cube. 
Then you do this again for something that is maybe like 2n, and you do sort of this exponential growth of parameters where you rescale back, you rescale back, and you can sort of take a limit of these sets, pass to the limit, and depending on how you choose the radius of the balls, you can get a set of whatever dimension you desire between zero and d. But because you constructed this out of basically the lattice, then counting or measuring distances really boils down to measuring how many distances are there in the lattice and just wiggling a tiny little bit. So it really connects back to the Erdős problem. And what one can show is that if you take sets, that you can find sets of dimension less, strictly less than d over two, whose distance sets have the back measure zero. Therefore, you have a conjecture. Well, surely you cannot do better than d over 2. And so the conjecture is that if you're above d over 2, then the Lubbock measure of the distance set should be positive. Including the equality. Oh. Ah, see, the end point, there I do not know what happens. And so I always exclude that one for safety. And I believe Falconer did that probably too, probably for safety. So that is a major open problem. And so when I re referenced before uh, the work of Schmerkin and Wang trying to quantify the dimension of the distance set, in fact, it, that takes place exactly at the threshold. Looking at, if you start with a set of dimension d over two, how big is the distance set in dimension? And I am not a betting man, so I don't want to bet on what happens there. If I had to, uh, I feel like probably not, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. And so that's kind of nice that you can see that there's this, that, that this is a very much a spiritual, like, uh, relative of the Erdős problem. Not only is the question type of similar, start with a large set, you have a large distance set. The sharpness example is practically the same up to geometric measure theory. Uh, and so you might be tempted at this point then to ask, well, does the continuous problem imply the discrete one? Short answer is no. Slightly longer answer is, if you work with point sets, so family of discrete point sets where the points somehow are well distributed, could be all. So like one notion could be homogeneous. So that basically means if you break your sort of plane up or your, your set up into little uh, boxes, then sort of no more than one point in each box. So they're somehow well distributed. That, that, that is like one notion of well distributed. In those type of settings, then results on the Falcon and distance problem uh, yield results to the discrete setting. And in fact, the, on the combinatorial side of things, people often work there. So in fact, the best results of Sola, Mosi, and Vu for the Erdős distance problem in higher dimensions, they have slight improvements if you assume that the set is homogeneous. Okay, so it's like not a uh, setting that you ignore, but it only implies the Erdős problem in those types of settings. Okay, so going the other way from Erdős to Falconer, no clue how you would do that. No, no known way that I'm aware of. Okay. So this is the question that we want to try to answer. Any questions about the setup so far? No? Okay. So first result, Falconer, when he posed the problem, uh, he compared it somewhat to Steinhaus's theorem. So you would have thought maybe he was going to go for positive Lubeck measure and containing an interval, but he only got positive Lebesgue measure, but look at this, look at the threshold, you got d over two plus a half, like this is within half of the conjecture. That's quite an exciting starting point, okay? Uh, this was improved significantly later by Matilda and Schilling, where they got sort of the uh, Steinhaus version of it, or the what comes from Steinhaus, which is that not only is the Lebesgue measure positive, but the distance set contains a whole interval. And, and let me just point out that having this structure is, is significant. Just think about the irrationals and the real line, measure as large as, you, uh, as it can be, yet they contain no interval at all. So having an interval says something about the structure. Not only do you have lots of distances, but they clump, okay? So it, it's saying quite a lot. And I wanted to add here that, uh, give a shout out to Alex Yosevich, Miles Moore, Google, and Crystal Taylor, who have extended this Matilda Schilling result to a whole range of distances. That is, so far, the 
the notion of distance that I've been using as the Euclidean one. But what if you took another one? Well, you can extend it to a lot of distances. What you need is basically the, the Euclid, that the ball, the unit ball in that distance needs to have non-vanishing curvature, and then basically everything follows. And the point is they have set up a very nice Fourier analytic scheme that sort of sheds light on all of these sort of simultaneously. Okay, so far, I hope I've been going not too hard and sort of going a little light. And so now I was gonna attempt three slides where I wanted to try to show you how these two come about. And I'm gonna do them simultaneously, which you can clearly see is not what happened in rea reality, right? Falconer didn't just like say, oh, I'm, I can't be bothered to show there's an interval. There's, it's a true sort of obstruction that it requires the right viewpoint. And so I'm showing you the sort of the more modern viewpoint that you can now find in say, Matilla's book on geometric measure theory and whatnot. Okay, so I'm gonna try that. So step one. The first thing that you might be concerned about trying to prove something like this is sort of a little analogous to what happens in the discrete world, where when you try to prove Erdős's problem, right, you're just given n points. You, you know nothing about how they're distributed. I mean, here you know a little bit more. You're given points and you know something about the dimension is above a certain threshold, but how do I use the notion of dimension? Okay. Um, I should maybe throw in in case there are grad students that so far I've been using the notion of house store dimension. You could ask questions with other types, Minkowski, Aswad, and whatnot. Uh, Hausdorff is the smallest, so it implies sort of it's, it's the strongest statement, but also Hausdorff dimension has lots of great analytical properties. And so it's actually a very nice one to work with. And you will see that right here. Okay. Uh, and so, how do I work with dimension? And so, there's this wonderful theorem. So, let's see, oh, uh, called Frostman's Lemma that says, if you have a set of a particular dimension, then you can come up, then you can take a threshold, any threshold that is lower than the dimension, uh, and you can construct a probability measure supported on the set, meaning that the measure is zero outside the set, such that the measure of any ball is controlled by the radius raised to that power. And so what you should be thinking about in the Euclidean setting, right, is the measure of a ball is uh, the radius raised to the dimension that you're working with. And this is practically that, slightly worse. You're not allowed to take the dimension, but you can take anything up to the dimension. And here, what is important is that you should be thinking about uh, the radius being small. This is not a question about what happens when the radius is large, it's about small radii. So the larger you take the S, the tighter control you have as in you're putting a small number. And so the higher power you have, the tighter the control. Uh, and so these are probability measures. And what this is saying conceptually is that you can't spike the measure somewhere. If you spike it somewhere, you can just take a ball around there and you will violate something like this. So, it, so this forces it to evenly distribute in some way. Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. That's sort of implicit for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Now, I should throw in, like, I hit one little thing in here, too. Is it also related to the energy of the measure? Yes, we're exactly going there. Exactly. And so, the direction that I told you here was that if you have a set of a particular dimension, then you can do something like this. So first of all, that makes me very happy because an analyst, it means that now I have a tool that really quantifies the dimension. Now I can work with measures instead of uh, definitions of house or dimension that have to do with coverings and things like that that are hard to work with. Uh, but Frostman's lemma is actually an if and only if statement. So it also says that if you can place these types of measures on your set, then the dimension is actually realized as, as the supremum of the thresholds that arise here. So it's actually if and only if, but I'm only going to use one direction here. Uh, and because this is from Frostman, then we often call mu a Frostman measure, okay? As, as Judge uh mentioned, then if we look at the integral here, this is often called the energy integral. Energy, well, 
the potential that you have here is just the Reese potential, the same thing that shows up in gravity and so many other things. So very reasonable to call this energy. Uh, on the Fourier side, which is very easy to switch to, then you can see that this really amounts to some sort of an L2 norm that is weighted really, it looks like a Sobolev type of a norm. S is uh, strictly less than D, so it's kind of like a negative Sobolev norm. And so not only do we get to take a uh, measure on the set, but we also control this energy integral, as in you control kind of a Sobolev norm of it. So this is amazing. So I started with just saying I had a set of a certain dimension, and I have, through geometric measure theory, I have uh, leveraged that into putting a measure on the set that has good control on balls and fulfills some sort of a Sobolev norm. I am in business for doing analysis now. Okay. So you mean that this, this energy is finite if you just satisfy that condition? It, yes. And so that is easy to see that if you satisfy this, this is fine. This actually could be a good, I don't know, prelim question or something. So if you write this out in a level set way, then it comes out very quickly. Uh, and so, yeah, that's a fun one to do. Uh, another thing, little note that I could put in here. So with a Frostman lemma, I said that was back and forth. Okay. Actually, energy integrals work somewhat the same way, that if you can look at the supremum of the energy thresholds uh, of measures that you can put on your set and for the thresholds where this is finite, then that sort of somehow quantifies the dimension as the dimension is the supremum over these energy thresholds. So it's actually a back and forth, although here I only use one direction. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Geometric measure theory is awesome, I like that, okay? Okay, any other questions? Okay, so next thing. Up until now, all I've been doing is that I've been getting my hands on the set E that is given to me, handed to me. But I'm supposed to be working with the distance set, so I better get my hands on the distance set too. And so what I'm gonna define here is a distance measure and using the letter delta for as a somewhat like a D for distance. And it's gonna depend on this mu because this distance measure depends, I'm gonna have it depend on the measure that I extract that encodes my set. And what I have over here really is a definition of a push forward measure. Really the distance measure is the push forward measure under the distance mapping of the set measure mu, okay? Uh, okay, it's a little bit of maybe functional analysis to see that you can do that, but not hard. And then to me, what this distance measure does, it's in some sense really asking, uh, what is the probability that this distance R appears? That's how I interpret it. So I've created a measure that is measuring the probability of a particular distance. That seems very useful to show that there are lots of distances. Okay, very easy observation. This is a probability measure. Why? Well, just throw in the function one here on the other side. Well, that just kills this thing here. Mu was a probability measure, easily see probability measure, okay? So indeed, if you run through all possible distances, yeah, <laughs> nothing outside of that can appear, okay? So with probability one, you're gonna get some distance. Now, what you can do now is that you can approximate mu. So working with mu itself, is kind of hard. So we do the thing that we do always in analysis when something is hard, we do a smooth approximation. So convolve mu with uh, approximate identity, get a mu epsilon, which is now a smooth function. And you can write sort of the push forward measure of that. And because now you're dealing with functions, then really you have functions here and then dx and dy, you're working with Lebesgue measurements and whatnot. If you switch to uh, polar coordinates, as in you encode the distance here as r, then really quickly you can see that you can write the integral this way. And if you compare sort of where you started and where you ended, you can see that you have really seen that the measure that you're working with here, in fact, has density with respect to the distance parameter. Okay. And then you have some hope because then you go, well, can I not just take a limit here? 
send epsilon to zero, show that this measure that I created in a fairly abstract way, in fact, actually has density and nice properties and stuff like that. Well, what is sigma? Ah, so I switched to polar coordinates. So sigma sub r is just a spherical measure, uh, sphere of radius r. Okay, and I'm glad that you pointed that out because I wanted to point out what shows up here. I'm really convolving a function with a spherical measure. And if you were here before lunch and saw Michael's talk, then that's something that appeared there. And I'll focus on that a little bit later, but we have sort of a spherical averaging operator arising there. Now, one thing you might be concerned about though, I've written here again, sort of what the density is, is that in this representation over here, you might be concerned about sending epsilon to zero. What will this convolution be convolving two measures? Oh, this could be distribution theory, this could be kind of hard. And so one thing you can do is that you can switch to the Fourier site where the, this density that you've derived has a very simple, nice sort of expression. And when you look at it in this site, then on the Fourier site, it's very easy to see that these approximations here are really tending towards mu hat itself. But is this a good quantity? Is this blowing up? Well, we all have all the tools right now. Uh, what we need to note is what Michael pointed out earlier, which is we need to understand the Fourier transform of the natural measure on the sphere. I wrote it here out just being on the unit sphere where I'm thinking about the sigma as being the normalized measure on the unit sphere. And if you've not seen Fourier transfers and measures, it's just the same as when you do it for functions. It's just then you write the D sigma and through stationary phase, as Michael pointed out, you get decay. One little nuance I'll put in here, sometimes this throws people off, is that this decay here is about what happens when psi is large, because some people look at this and think, oh, there's a blow up at the origin. And there is no such thing. This thing is bounded at the origin. Uh, it is bounded because if you just move the absolute values in sight, then D sigma is just a probability measure, so you're bounded by one. So there's no blow up there. This is a statement about what happens at infinity. But this is psi to a power. This is, if I move this up over here, I see I have a representation which, which is exactly the energy integral. And so in the limit, I get an expression like this, and it is bounded by the energy integral, so it's finite. So I have a well-defined density. And so that already is enough for me to prove the first result that Falconer had. But further, if I look at sort of the dependence on R in the density, well, this is a nice function of R. Uh, this is a very nice function, the mu hat. Okay, uh, this function as a function of R not only is continuous, is actually differentiable and whatnot. And so, not so it's a bounded continuous function, it is super nice. So, how do we finish this? Just one last line here to finish this. So, we observed that this distance measure it was a probability measure. I can now, through what I have done, my work, I can actually write it out, and I'm abusing notation a little bit. I'm using the delta mu of R to denote the de density. I can write it out as the density dr. Well, the density is bounded. It's bounded by the energy integral. And that is uniform in the epsilon and whatnot, so no worries about that. What is left, if I pull that out by L infinity, is simply the Lebesgue measure of the distance set. And so if this is bounded, I can divide by it, and it tells me that the Lebesgue measure is positive. And then you go beyond that and you say, okay, I have found a probability measure that is positive uh, with continuous uh, density. Well, that density better be positive somewhere, right? If it were zero everywhere, it wouldn't be a probability measure, but it's continuous. So as soon as it's positive somewhere, it's positive in a whole neighborhood. Ta-da, you have shown that there's a whole interval of distances that must be included there, okay? So a wild overkill to talk about this being differentiable and whatnot, just need the continuity. So would this require mm -hmm. some kind of uh, bound on the positive dimension of E for that when you get the energy? Integral? Yes, yes. So when you get the energy integral, when you plug this thing in here, then the energy integral was something of the form D minus S or something like that. So what you will get is D minus D minus one over two. That's where the D plus one over two arises from. So it's from that difference. And that yields the threshold. Question. 
Of of new hat. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. So, well, in an average sense, for sure, maybe not pointwise. Yeah. So, like, I I can take I can take LP norms of mu hat, and that maybe describes some sort of average decay rates just using the energy integral. Really, everything that I can say about mu hat is encoded by the energy integral. That's the only way I know how to get my hands on you hat. Does that answer the question? Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, sort of in an average sense. I, I, I mean, Campus has coded an actual zero, which behaves very badly for LP coherence. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so this is the story of how you can get Falconer's result, Matilda Schillen's result, get all these sort of basic ones, and they're all here in one package. And so that's kind of nice. Um, but the spherical averaging operator, that's something that arose. So we have this object here, maybe if I rescale it, this is sort of my standard version of the spherical averaging operator. Uh, so this is properly normalized so that the integral so, so so it's normalized it's truly an averaging operator it doesn't blow up as you blow up the scale and we of course saw this heavily in michael's talk already but it's kind of nice that through this proof this spherical averaging operator arises because this is this was our fundamental idea right and there's problem that somehow circles or balls encode distances and we see that appear here yet again in some form okay uh, because of things that I'm going to do tomorrow, I'm going to show you some very trivial calculations. So if you have that spherical averaging operator, which I've written again up over here, it is really easy to get some LP estimates on it. On L infinity, you simply just move the L infinity inside and then, well, the, the, this is normalized. So the integral over the sphere is going to be one. So you're trivially bounded by L infinity. Likewise, on L1, if you take an L1 norm, you just switch the order of integration with Fubini. Uh, and again, normalize, so you're bounded by L1. As soon as you have these two estimates, you see trivially that the spherical averaging operator is bounded from LP to LP, or LP bigger than equal to one. And no wonder averages shouldn't really make the, in, make the outputs worse than the inputs, okay? But of course, the point that was very evident in Michael's talk is that, not only should the output be at least as good as the input, it should in fact be significantly better. That is because really this is a convolution operator with, if you, which if you view it on the Fourier side, it's with a symbol as in, if you look at the hat of the natural measure here, it's not just a bounded symbol, it's a symbol that decays at infinity, so things should be better. Therefore, we have results, like Michael Pine pointed out, these LP improving types of estimates, and then you can interpolate them and get, as Michael pointed out, the full sort of triangle of LP estimates that you can get for this object. Okay, so it's, it's a really, really nice object. Um, and Sobel of bounds, of course, come from three, and they're like, you can continue with all sorts of things. Now, just to throw in, so Michael focused a lot on uh, Lacanary maximal operators or single scale maximal operators. So just for fun, I decided to complete the story a little bit, although it came up in the questions a little bit and say that you can also look at full on maximal averaging operators. So what happens here is that instead of fixing a particular radius and always averaging over the same kind of a ball, then at every single point, you pick the worst ball you possibly could and replace the function with that. It's not obvious how that should behave, even though averages make things better. If you always pick the worst ball, how is that gonna behave? Well, these are some of the major developments in the last century. So Eli Stein, these are the spherical maximal operators of Eli Stein. I, think I had to mention him. I think that was a challenge for Michael earlier. Uh, uh, showed that this mapped LP to LP if P is bigger than D over D minus one. And as he pointed out, when you're in dimension two, then L2 becomes inaccessible. And so this was the major result of Borgan on the circular maximal averaging operator showing that indeed, then you still have LP to LP map boundedness. Okay. 
in terms of usefulness than maximal operators. Uh, like one cool thing is, if, if you recall the Lebesgue differentiation type theorem, where you look at an average of a function over a full ball, you can, if you're in, you can take a limit, right? You recover the value of the function at the center if you're in an appropriate LP space. Uh, classic and various sort of real analysis classes, measure theory classes, uh, building on the hardy lowood maximal operator. And the cool thing is like these spherical averaging operators, like the maximal versions can be used for similar types of theorems, but now averages that are only taking place on shells. And it's kind of cool that you can go to something that singular and still get a limit of the function at the point at the center. But granted now you, what you have to give up is that you need to be in an LP space where P is slightly larger than for the Lebesgue differentiation type theorem. Okay, then you can talk about solutions to PDEs and whatnot. This helps with point-wise convergence, all sorts of cool connections. Sorry, a weak type. Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I, yeah. I, I, mm, wait, wait. Ah, restricted weak type. It's not full-on weak type. I'm always sloppy with that because I yeah, indicator functions. They're great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay, and we have spent enough time on this. Let me then tell you a little bit about that you can do a little bit better. So this was like a, so what's the storyline been so far? It's one, seeing distance problems. Two, getting a little gauge of like how they work. And so what you saw before was something about showing that the distance measure had a density, it was bounded, and then you got nice results. And some of the tools or implicit objects that arise are things like spherical averaging operators. Here is a slight improvement on this idea. Well, as soon as you've gotten an idea that to show that the L infinity norm of the density is bounded, you, you go, why not show that a density that maybe has L2 bounded density or something of the type, okay? Uh, why is that enough? Well, because it's a probability measure again. And if you just use Cauchy-Schwarz now, instead of just pulling something by, out by L infinity, I think this is something very similar to what showed in Yakimo's talk uh, this morning, uh, well then, if this L2 norm is bounded, you can divide by it and you can see that the Lebesgue measure is positive, okay? So might be a smarter idea. And this idea is something that has given rise to all modern improvements on sort of the original Falconer distance problem. And so this is a scheme set out by Matela. And so I'm gonna show you a little bit what kind of objects arise. And what I'm gonna show you is not Matilla's original derivation of this. This is like a modern viewpoint uh, that I was involved in using something called the group action technique. Uh, and it's really, really simple. It says, what you really wanna, if, if I'm abusing notation a little bit, what you really wanna show is that the L2 norm of the density is bounded. And you do a really silly thing, which is you just write it out as a double integral along a diagonal. like. What should that do for you? That is very questionable. Well, if you have two distances that have to be the same, well, they're arising from some points. Like these are push forward measures. So if you go through the definition, then these distances are coming from some points. It means that maybe R is represented by X and Y, the distance between them, S is represented by two other points. And what you note is that if the distance between two points is the same, it means that really you can rotate one vector into the other using an element, say, from the orthogonal group. If you reorganize this a little bit, you can take this expression here and just move things over and get a symmetric sort of statement. It says something about there's some quantity that is sort of preserved when you're doing this. And what it allows you to do after a little bit of rearranging is to write this L2 norm of the density bounded really by an expression that is here on the right-hand side. And what has happened really is that you have been able to insert something that wasn't here originally. You've been able to insert an average in the orthogonal group. So what I'm writing here, DG, really is the Haar measure on the orthogonal group. And so really you should be thinking about is this is an average as you rotate your vector around. And as soon as I start doing that, you are starting to think there's a spherical averaging operator there. And in fact, if you then change variables. So if you take that psi and write it out as a radius and then the spherical component, you can actually read, write this and get this expression over here. 
Now, this is really simple in some ways. It's just rotations and integrate along the diagonal. Uh, where does this come from? So in the resolution of the area distance problem, there's a really important milestone before Kuth and Katz solved it. It was a framework introduced by Alakas and Sharir, group action technique uh, that Kuth and Katz heavily built on. And this is really an adaptation of that. So I was involved in that with uh, Alan Greenlee, <laughs> Alex Josevich, and Bochin Lu, where we took that machinery and brought it to the continuous theory. Let me point out that in the discrete world, the Alakashiria framework, the group action is there. They've only been useful in the plane. Not, nobody has gotten anything out of it in higher dimensions, whereas here we brought it into any kind of a dimension. And it yielded a new sort of derivation of this expression here as being a key quantity that needed to be bounded. Prior to that, there existed a Bessel function type uh, expansion that yielded this as a leading term. So it was kind of clear that you had to bound this, but there were a bunch of error terms. So you had to show that they were bounded. And so somehow this, this is basic geometry that shows that this is the right object to look at, which is kind of cool. No, because Matilla is the one who sort of set this scheme forth. He put out this challenge and said, this is what you need to bound. How are you gonna do that? I like to call this the Matilla integral. And to connect to talks that were here last week, then what are we looking at here? We have like a Fourier terrorism of mu, it's being restricted just to the sphere. So it's kind of like a restriction estimate going on here, but it's weighted, there's a weight going on over here. So there are lots of sort of connections to things that people were talking about last week. Uh, in fact, trying to bound this, all the results, and I'm gonna tell you who was involved on the next slide a little bit, uh, have come, or at least the most recent ones have come through papers that were working on maximal Schrodinger operators. And then because there are same kind of objects that arise, and it has to do with restriction, decoupling shows up and whatnot, they lead to results on the falconer distance problem. So all of a sudden you can see that something that's maybe seemed like a contrived sort of question about just configurations, distributions of points has now all of a sudden connected with deep sort of mainstream uh, stories within harmonic analysis. Yep. How do you get squares? Oh, oh, over here or, ah, so, so one has to do a little bit of maneuvering. So what happens is that when you switch to polar coordinates over here, then here, not a whole lot happens, but here you have like an averaging. And so you can quickly see that the same thing kind of shows up twice in some sense. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it would be better to do this offline, yeah. trying to, but, but, but up to a constant, this is what you get. And it should be just maneuvering symbols around. But this is really L2, right? Can, can you do this with LT? Ah, no, nobody has done that. So L2, of course, is so powerful because you have L2 techniques. Uh, so, okay, spoiler alert for tomorrow. One of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to push to, well, I kind of already said it. I'm going to push to higher order point configurations. You can try to do similar types of things, but it leads to expressions that are not sort of L2 built. And so I don't get nice things like that but I get things that are related that I would love to know how to bound. So I'm gonna throw that probably out tomorrow. I was like, oh, yeah, here's an open question. I would love to understand how this works in a smarter way than I do already. Okay, so a little sort of teaser. Okay, so how do people bound something like this? Well, there are two of these parentheses because it's squared. Take one of them. So this is one of them. And what people try to do is that they try to bound it just with the power of R, okay? Um, some sort of decay. Now, when you have done that, you can plug that back in here. What do you have? You have R to a power that comes from over here, as well as the one that was left over. Then you have a mu hat squared. And if you switch back from polar coordinates just to regular, coordinates, you will see that you have an energy integral and whatever comes out of this thing here leads to a threshold. Okay, on showing the boundedness of the ultra norm of that density. Now this integral, this sort of restricted weighted integral, uh, this is a big deal, trying to show that 
show these types of bounds. This is not trivial. I've stated sort of what the bounds look like when you're in sort of the regime that is important to Falconer. People also do this in regimes that are lower, like what if you're working on the dimension of the distance set and whatnot. And to make a long story short, then just to remind you that the original threshold was d over two plus a half. So improvements, the first improvements due to Wolf in the plane where he showed the sharp result for that integral that I showed you, he got d, d over two plus a third, which you can translate to, that is what, four thirds in the plane. And Erdogan came along and then extended this into higher dimensions. However, the results were not sharp, as in the estimates on that integral that I showed you were not sharp. It just happened to recreate the same threshold or same style threshold in higher dimensions. So then there was amazing work by a number of authors. Um, so Schumann Du, Larry Guth, Alice Josephich, Schumann Go, Kevin Ren, uh, Hong Wang, Bobby Wilson, and Ru Zheng Zhang. Uh, a subset of them first proved an improvement here down to D over two plus a quarter plus a tiny little bit. Uh, that was, so, First, it was proved in 3D. Uh, then it was extended to higher dimensions by Zhu Mindu and Ru Zhang Zhang, so uh, first and last. Uh, and what they did was that they resolved that maximal Schrodinger operator type of a question, and in the, at the same time, resolved the boundedness results of that integral that I showed you, which gave you these best results. And then you go, that is kind of sad. They resolved an extremely hard question, and we only got down to here. Okay, we're still quite some ways off. Two thousand eighteen was a really fun time. Uh, that is when they first did this in three D. Uh, in three D, then out came the paper where they did this in higher dimensions. Then more papers appeared, and they got down to D over two plus a quarter. They cut that out. Granted, only in even dimensions. Okay, and well, again, first they did it just in. Um, 4D, then they did it in higher dimensions. Oh, sorry, first they did it in 2D, then they did it in higher dimensions. Uh, and you might go, how did they do that? Like, you have sharp results in the scheme that I showed you. How can you go lower? And the answer is simply, they understood why, that why the bounds on that integral were sharp. It was because of some particular bad examples. If you extract those examples, you can prove better bounds. But then you have to handle those special cases that you extracted specifically, and that they did, and they reached something like this, which is pretty cool. Uh, then for fun, so I organized a conference, or was a co-organizer of a conference on harmonic analysis and fractal sets at the Ohio State this spring. Xu Du gave one of the plenary lectures, and she promised that a forthcoming was an improvement of these things, building sort of similar types of techniques using decoupling extracting the bad sets. So uh, this is definitely not out on the archive, so I'm just throwing out there, maybe look for this. If this comes out, this will be a big deal. That's kind of cool. Uh, I thought that was exciting. Um, and I think, I think that's, a, I'm gonna skip this last slide and just say, uh, thank you. I think that's a great place to stop. So could you go back to the last, uh, I mean, the last slide you presented? Yes, yes. So how this dimension even and odd matters in the proof? Sorry, how? Even dimension and odd dimension matters in the proof. Why is even dimension yeah. coming? Oh, why is even dimension? Okay. Um, I think it has to do maybe with the, so, so it's actually kind of cool. So the special case that they have to extract is called train tracks. And it genuinely looks like you have lines of points and then little segments in between. And I think, <coughs> I think it's from handling that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether it's from handling that special case, whether, whether they only can work on that or if it's in the decoupling thing. Um, I think it's with a, yeah. I'll take a, I'll answer you later. I'll, I'll take a look at that. But, but, but it's in the proof structure and they really do not know. Uh, maybe, maybe Zhu Mindu knows in this forthcoming one have to do it, but they really don't, didn't know how to push it to 3D. Thank you, sir. Yep. Are there works 
are there works of this type in outside euclidean spaces uh, yes uh, yes okay 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 so unsatisfyingly so uh, in the following sense do this on the sphere well on the sphere just localize it looks like rd you immediately get the same thresholds right what about uh, real hyperbolic spaces well you can do so basically all the results that i know are of the form oh zoom in localize it looks like rd so if you have something that does not look like rd well that could be we could talk about that like that that i do not know what happens there okay but you bring up an interesting point because there is an idea so let's recall how the sharpness examples were created they were created from creating a lattice right you're on the sphere some of the lattice is not natural on the sphere like yes as a patch that looks like rd surely you can put a lattice there but it doesn't look very lattice like and so somehow the obstructions like the reason you get these thresholds somehow is one could phrase as ar arithmetic structure you have the lattice it has arithmetic structure that is the obstruction on the sphere somehow you don't have the same arithmetic structure so there's a folklore idea floating out there not for me like this has existed for a while that says maybe just maybe you should obtain better results on curved things where you don't have arithmetic structure for example on the sphere and just nobody's close but that would be like a really really cool thing if anyone could exhibit that Changing the group law, I think uh, recently, a few years back, I, yeah. I had seen one work, I forgot the name of the author, on Heisenberg group. Yes. Are you utilizing the uh, uh, material integral energy. Okay, yeah. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Heisenberg group definitely sees action. Yes, yes, yes. I'm just a very Euclidean guy, so. Uh, so, so if the Hausdorff dimension is bigger than d by two, then the Lebesgue measure is positive. That is a conjecture, right? So instead of uh, positive measure, yep. uh, if I want that the Hausdorff measure is let's say two by three or log two by log three, then can we have some lower bounds on the set? Uh, I mean, say similar problems, oh, oh, quantifying different distances. Yes. I see. I see. Are you asking like if you know that the distance set is of a certain size? Yes. Then you can go back. Yes, and obtain a lower bound or something like that. I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, let, let's just think about it over here. Uh, right. But you're saying this is kind of trivial for the uh, for the Lebesgue measure, right? Yeah. Okay. So then I can tell you there exists similar type of results for dimensional thresholds that are of the type, if you're above a certain dimension, then the distance set must be at least of this threshold. So just as you reverse the, the back ones, you can do the same for dimension. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and it brings up a fun point, which is to note that really these are extremal questions that remind me a little bit of what Yakumo was talking about today. It's about finding the best possible points and stuff like that. So let's just note that like these thresholds D over two are stupid if you have like nice things, like if you have a curve in RD, well, yeah, it's gonna have a positive distance measure, right? It's far smaller than the threshold. The threshold is about guarantee that the worst, absolutely worst cases go through. More questions? Okay, I think, yeah. You have something? Online. Online, online. Let me, let me see. So are there questions from the online audience? Oops. Uh, hello. So are there some questions from the online audience? I don't think so. Okay, I think. Yeah, I think we can. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So let us thank this speaker once more. Should give you this. Yeah.
is larger than x under p x plus epsilon and under p mu. So this is just a binary entropy uh, divergence here. And this uh, binary entropy uh, divergence, I can uh, lower bound it by a simple inequality. So if I look at those terms, this one is close to one and this one is close to zero. This is my deviation probability and this is my typical event, okay? So I can use a, a simple lower bound in that case uh, that is very elementary to prove that this KL of uh, P and Q is almost P log one over Q, so up to a minus. because it's the free parameter. So uh, doing it amounts to taking epsilon of order one over square root 10 indeed. Uh, and so we have something that should not be so far here yeah, uh, from this. Still, I'm not claiming that this permits to obtain the best lower bound uh, one can have, especially for Bernoulli variable. So small technical. Uh, I hope I will get extra time for. Thank you. So I, I'm not claiming that this is the best inequality and the most interesting we can get for, for this problem, especially for Bernoulli, but just that there is a very simple and generic uh, way to prove lower bounds that we will use in many different settings that is very uh, practical in this, and that is an alternative to the change of measure argument. So for example, if you know about bandits, you know the lyon robbins law, uh, uh, law uh, lower bounds for uh, regret. Well, we can prove more simply the lion robits lower bounds for regret using such, uh, such argument. So now why we have uh, uh, considered these uh, reminders, uh, we can start our optimization program, so our black box here. And as I told you, we'll start with this very gentle, in a very gentle way, where you have, we have a function on x, where x is just a two-point set, uh, zero and one. Okay, and we have to find the value between f of zero and f of one, which is the largest. And in fact, it's, it's even still too complicated. We assume that we know f of zero. f of zero is equal to zero. We just have some uncertainty about f of one. We don't know if it's larger or smaller than zero. So f of one is a Gaussian variable with mean mu and uh, variance sigma squared. So in that case, uh, we don't have much uh, hesitation about what points to observe. We always observe uh, xt equals one, okay? And uh, we should stop as soon as we are pretty sure that, uh, well, either mu is smaller than epsilon, in which case we should output zero, 
r mu is larger than minus epsilon, in that case, we should output one. So it's a testing problem, but non-classical in the sense that the two hypotheses overlap. Well, my claim is that overlapping hypothesis is the right uh, way to, to, uh, to consider testing, even if it's not uh, what is done in general. Uh, but here it appears clearly. So uh, if uh, mu is actually between minus epsilon and epsilon, we don't care what we answer. We can answer either zero or one. The two answers are correct. And the question is, uh, how many samples do we need to do this, to, to, to find out uh, uh, if mu is like this or like that? Well, we can compute it pretty exactly. We have the following result. For every epsilon delta pack strategy, the expectation of under mu of uh, tau delta has to be larger than uh, two sigma squared divided by absolute value of mu plus epsilon squared times log one over delta. Um, it's an asymptotic result. So this is true only when delta goes to zero. We will see why. And uh, besides, there is a strategy that reaches the law, this lower bound, a simple strategy, namely a one that uh, has a simple interpretation we will see. And but for the time being, we can only remind, remind that the limb sup of the expectation of the same thing here is actually smaller than the complexity. Thus, in that sense, the algorithm is asymptotically optimal and we have determined the exact complexity of this optimization problem, which is equal to uh, this term here. So how do we get such a bound? Well, in fact, um, the, the idea will be sim systematically change of measure. So we cannot stop before we, uh, the, uh, we have an alternative hypothesis that is sufficiently likely to produce the data. So as we will call uh, for every function f, we will call alt of f during the, the entire talk, the set of functions for which uh, the optimal points of f of f is not included in the optimal points of j. So in that case, it means that if mu is larger than epsilon, the, al the alternative of uh, mu, the function f is identified to mu in that case, is uh, minus, uh, infinity minus epsilon, because in, in that case, uh, we shouldn't answer negative. And uh, similarly, if mu is smaller than epsilon, we shouldn't answer positive. And if mu uh, is uh, uh, between minus epsilon between, uh, and plus epsilon, the alternative set is the union of those two sets. So here, any answer is correct, but they are, uh, still the alt of mu is defined like this. So I'm not claiming that the intersection of the optimal set is empty. That's the definition. And how do we prove uh, the lower bound? We will prove it, well, by change of measures argument, just like in our lower bound we had in the deviation bound uh, originally. And, uh, as you will see, as we have seen, indeed, there are two ways to write this uh, change of measure uh, argument. The low, what we call the low level form and the high level form. So the low level form is exactly the way I first wrote the change of measure by relating the probability of an event under probability uh, under low G to the probability under uh, another parameter F. And uh, we had to correct for a probability that the log likelihood ratio was too high and uh, times exponential minus uh, this uh, log likelihood ratio. So here we recognize very summarized the slide that we had on the change of measure initially. And the high level form is the one that was manipulating directly KL divergence. It says that the KL divergence of my observation up to time two under parameter F and J, um, well, the expectation of this, which can be simply computed, is by contraction larger than the probability of an event C under F as a KL of, uh, between the probability of under F and probability under G. Uh, actually, the proof of those two lemmas, we have already seen it in the preparatory work here, but it's uh, summarized, rewritten in a way, in a generic way, not specific to Bernoulli variables and, uh, extent, and uh, deviation probability. And uh, in our case, uh, how does it translate? Well, it permits to show that actually when uh, uh, the expect uh, this term, the expectation of the log likelihood ratio, it's just uh, the expectation of tau, the kind of valt lemma, times uh, the KL divergence of between the two observations. And uh, you know that between quotients, the KL divergence is just, uh, just the squared like this. 
to the high level form uh, rewrites uh, rewrite li like this. And it, it directly gives a lower bound for the case where mu is smaller than minus epsilon or mu larger than epsilon. Because we can take in that case lambda equals epsilon. C, the event we consider is that uh, uh, we answer positive. So we answer that uh, one is the optimal point, which is uh, uh, incorrect under mu and correct under lambda. So it has probability smaller than delta under mu and larger than one minus delta under C. And we get the lower bound that the expectation of uh, tau times this uh, square here uh, is larger than the KL of delta to minus delta, uh, which is of order log uh, one over delta. So actually, this proves the first, uh, this proves this inequality just for the case where mu is smaller than minus epsilon or larger than plus epsilon, but it proves it in a totally non asymptotic way. The inequality is true in that case. Asymptotic uh, inequality is necessary for the case where uh, mu is between minus epsilon and epsilon. This will be my, my first uh, question to the audience, actually. Can you prove this inequality for the case mu between minus epsilon and plus epsilon by using the high-level form? We were never able to do it. We always had to dig into this uh, low-level change of measure. And the consequence is that we only get asymptotic bounds, asymptotic lower bounds, which is a bit of a pain. So it appears empirically that actually uh, the lower bound is not true exactly for uh, mu between minus epsilon and, and epsilon. We expect that there is a, something that depends on, uh, on delta here, uh, non-trivial. But still, uh, we are very interested in trying to get rid of this uh, awful uh, low level proof in the case where mu is minus, between minus epsilon and plus epsilon. Now, the strategy. How do we reach this uh, optimal complexity? Well, there are two ways to see it. The simplest way probably is the graphical one. So imagine uh, we consider the random walk whose increments at the are the observations of our unknown arms. So it's a, it's a biased uh, random walk, OK? Uh, more or less a Brownian motion, OK? A discretized Brownian motion with either a drift that is positive or a drift that is uh, negative, uh, we don't know. So if it's larger than mu, uh, the drift will be larger than the, the drift under parameter epsilon so, uh, here. And if mu is smaller than minus epsilon, the drift will be smaller than this drift here. So how to make the, the difference simply and how to know if we are in the case where the drift is like this or the drift is like that. So we can simply con uh, construct a confidence region for both, both cases. So here I have uh, con the uh, confidence uh, interval, say, for any random world that has a drift uh, below this uh, curve here. Here I write uh, minus epsilon times t plus uh, square root of t times the variance. So I have something that, uh, that, uh, that grows like this. And similarly, this is a lower bound for the random walk if the parameter is indeed larger than plus epsilon. So my procedure will be very simple. It will see the random walk. And as soon as it gets out of one of the two boundaries like this, we stop. OK? And if actually mu is smaller than minus epsilon, the probability that we ever get above this curve will be smaller than delta. That's how we construct it. And similarly, if the drift is above uh, uh, plus epsilon, probability to go below, below this curve will be smaller than, uh, than delta. So our stopping time will si simply be the first moment when we go either below this curve or above this curve. So this will be for sure between, before the time where they meet here, because after that they have an empty intersection. And uh, we can prove that on average, it will happen approximately here. So when a typical run going up will uh, uh, cross this uh, upper curve here. And when we compute this moment here, we find that it is exactly sigma squared log one over delta divided by two epsilon. And so we just need to upper bound the probability that it is larger related actually to a probability of deviation for x n bar. It means that, uh, okay, uh, if, if the drift is actually larger than epsilon and we are not finished at that time, it means that our x n bar is larger than it should. And uh, 
This will happen with smaller and smaller probability, and so we will upper bound the, the probability like this. So this is the first way to see it. The other way, the statistical way to see it, is con to consider a generalized likelihood ratio test. So uh, if you write the statistic of the generalized likelihood ratio test, you obtain, uh, you, you obtain it like this. And actually, what you get is exactly the same procedure. It's strictly equivalent to what I, I explained before. This is the same, uh, the same test. And it will stop at the same moment. And we can study the properties of this uh, sequential GLRT. And as I told you, we can prove quite reasonably simply that uh, the expectation of the stopping time will be smaller than uh, the complexity term here. So in a way, this simplistic problem, one and a half armed bandit, is uh, solved, and we have exactly the complexity. Now, can we go further? So further would be to consider now a plain vanilla bandit model. That is to say, a problem of optimization where the set of arms is discrete and there is no structure, okay? No relation between the parameters. So this is what the situation looks like. You have Gaussians, they have some uh, means, and uh, you would like to find the one with the, the largest mean. So you may sample like you want from any of them. So probably you will sample a lot the largest one. If one is really smaller than the others, you don't need to sample it as much as the others before you stop. Uh, the question is, how do you do it optimally? There are lots of ideas that have been proposed. And uh, for example, uh, the racing strategy is probably intuitively the, the most simple. So you can keep confidence intervals for the value of the function at every point. And uh, as soon as you have an arm for which the upper bound of the confidence interval is smaller than the lower bound of another confidence interval, uh, you know that this one is not, uh, is not optimal and that you can forget it. Okay, so in the first time for, uh, for the moment, uh, I will consider the case epsilon equals zero. So I really want to find the arm with the highest mean and not an epsilon optimal, just to make this simple. So this uh, uh, racing strategy, uh, I explained how to eliminate arms and now, um, uh, I have to specify how I sample the arms, so uh, it's not complicated. Uh, there are different propositions, but you can think that for such algorithms, you can prove that they are delta correct if you tune the confidence intervals correctly, and you can even find upper bounds on the complexity related to the gaps between the, the arms, that is to say the distance between f of x and f and the optimal value of f. Um, Yes. Actually, so these are ideas and there were bounds and algorithms studied like this. But uh, what we wanted to do with Emily in that case, that dates back to 2016, was to find really the complexity of this problem. And uh, we could pro prove the theorem, uh, the following theorem, like the expectation of tau for any delta correct algorithm, so there's no epsilon here, uh, is larger than log one over delta, say, times some function T, so T star of the function f, where T star of f is a, is a property of the function that appears to be the solution of a min max problem like this, solution of a kind of a game. Um, okay, and uh, let's see how, how to prove uh, and how to get such a, a, a result. And then we will see that just as before, uh, this complexity can be reached so that this is really the complexity of uh, best time identification in vanilla bandit problem. Uh, here we will apply the entropic lower bound, the high level entropic lower bound uh, method, which says in that case that uh, so the KL of the observation from time, uh, from time one to time two can be written as uh, so still our valid lemma sum of the expectation of the number of times I, I draw x times the distance from f to j at x, and that this uh, thing is uh, larger, just as before, than kl of 1 minus delta and delta if j is in the alternative of f, that is to say, if uh, they don't have here the same, uh, the same optimal. So this is exactly the same idea as we had used before, but just with, uh, with many arms. And now, uh, if we apply this change of measure uh, method, we can have a first idea how to apply it to obtain the first lower bound on the complexity. Uh, how does it go? So if I take a point A that is suboptimal, well, well, I change the problem, I make it optimal, so I change F of A 
I can change f to j by defining j of uh, a to be f star, so that it is optimal now, and it doesn't have the same optimal points as a uh, function f, or f star plus epsilon, if, if you want. Yes? Uh, here? This one? Oh, okay. So uh, I went a bit fast behind this. So there's a martingale uh, argument and stopping time uh, behind it. But uh, morally, it's a tensorization property that the KL of a product measure is the sum of the KL. Okay? Just here, the number of observations of each arm is random. So uh, oh, this is the KL of a Gaussian. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm still in the Gaussian setting. Yes. Okay, so now uh, if I want to, to, to change, uh, if I want to allow bound on the number of times I draw arm A, well, I make it optimal. So I build J so that J of A now is optimal by changing uh, just the value of F at, uh, at this point A. And I apply the previous lower bound and I obtain the expectation of NA of 2 times F of A minus F star squared divided by 2 sigma squared is larger than log 1 over delta. And similarly, for, for the optimal point, I can make it suboptimal by changing it to any other point and obtain the same, uh, the same kind of thing. So that now if I sum on uh, all the arms and I sum the expectation of the number of draws of arm X up to time 2, well, when they sum, they sum to the expectation of the stopping time to the total number of observations. And when I sum those, those lower bound, I obtain that they are uh, larger than the sum over x of 2 sigma squared divided by the gap delta x squared times uh, log 1 over delta. So this was the kind of bounds uh, we were previously able to obtain. The problem is that they, those bounds are not optimal because we are doing the changes of measure independently. So the good idea to really identify the optimal uh, complexity of this problem was to combine those inequalities. So uh, we, we can make mu2 suboptimal by changing mu1 and mu2 to some uh, m2 and swapping them in that way. Uh, and uh, that's how we get uh, uh, the f uh, first inequality. But we can change uh, mu3 or we can change with mu4. So for all of these points, we have this uh, inequality that we've seen before. So actually, this inequality is true for the infimum on J of, uh, of this. The infimum of these quantities is larger than KL of uh, delta 1 minus delta. It takes uh, months to combine them, but just uh, writing this, uh, this infimum here. And once it was done, it remains only to multiply and divide by the expectation of, uh, of tau here, and to realize that those quantities, they sum to 1, and then to lower bound, uh, to up upon this quantity by the supremum over omega to obtain something that doesn't depend on the algorithm anymore. And now that we have written this, well, we have our lower bound. We have proved that the expectation of tau times something that only depends on the function f is larger than uh, log 1 over delta. So this is how to get this, uh, this lower bound. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, it can be related, in fact, to uh, the naive bound we have to obtain like this. So uh, actually, uh, this t star of f, it is always larger than uh, the upper bound we had by the naive method. OK, we have improved the naive method. But uh, we can prove simply that it is at most twice larger in the Gaussian case. So it's not at all true in other models. Here, I focus on the Gaussian case just for the clarity, but the arguments extend to a general one parameter exponential families with no difficulty. Just in the Gaussian case, one can prove that actually the gap bound is uh, correct up to a factor two only. And uh, well, this extends to pack optimization. So that is to say, when we only want to find epsilon optimal arms, then we get a result that is similar, except that again, the fact that we have several possible correct answers now changes our lower bound to an asymptotic lower bound. And the technique is no longer the high level, but the low level form. We are obliged to, to use it, and we are sorry for that. So apart from this, we get a result that is pretty similar. The limit of exponential tau divided by log 1 over delta is larger than 
the complexity term. It's no longer T star of F, it's T star epsilon of F because there's a small epsilon showing up in the optimization problem uh, that we have here. Uh, Now, uh, how to reach those, uh, those uh, complexity terms? Well, again, the way to obtain a an optimal procedure from that is to use a GLRT, a GLRT stopping rule. The GLRT we can compute in, in that case. It looks like this. It's uh, the first moment when we have such an expression. Uh, okay, I won't go into it. It has a simple explanation. It has several simple interpretations, indeed, uh, that we expressed in our 2016 paper. But uh, what you should only remember is that, uh, well, choosing correctly a result here for the GLRT, we can prove that we built a procedure that is probably approximately correct. And now how to use, uh, how to sample. So we had the stopping rule, we need the sampling rule. Well, actually, what is pretty unexpected and uh, interesting is that our law bound, uh, this one, does not only furnish the complexity of the problem, but it also tells you how to solve it. When you read it a bit more carefully, you see that uh, in the proof at some point, yes, here, we replaced the expectation of nx of tau divided by ef of tau by a supremum over omega. So if we want to reach the supremum here, we have to make an algorithm that for which the proportion of draws of each arm respect the omega here, that uh, are the solution of the optimal, uh, of the optimal program. And uh, this suggests the algorithm that we call the uh, track and stop. So track and stop has a sampling strategy that uh, just amounts to estimate at every time what is the complexity of the problem by solving the optimization problem. So finding the omega star for the estimated problem and then track the optimal proportion for this thing. And if everything goes well, so our estimates of each of the values f of x will converge to the right value. So we can prove the continuity of the optimal weights with respect to uh, those uh, values. And if we track them, we can prove that uh, the limiting frequency of draws of each arm will indeed tend to the optimal uh, frequency uh, that we are uh, searching. And hence, that uh, our algorithm will be, will be optimal. So combining the two, this permits to show that our track and stop uh, strategy has a complexity that uh, tends to the expectation of, uh, to, uh, to T star of F. So we can do uh, some experiments and uh, indeed obtain that it does better than the racing algorithm, for example, that I showed you before. But now uh, in the five or six minutes that I have left, I wanted to show you now how to go a little beyond the vanilla bandit problem and to in include some structure. Our final goal is still to optimize continuous function, but we will still have one intermediate step. And this intermediate step will be to do maximization this time on a function defined on a graph with a graph smoothness condition. So a graph, we have already seen plenty of them uh, today. Um, we have, they have a, an adjacency matrix, which I denote by uh, W. And uh, I will call uh, S of uh, F, the smoothness for the graph G of F, which is a quantity. So it's a L2 norm under the Laplacian of, of F. We will assume that it's smaller than R. That means that for points X and Y that are uh, strongly related by the graph, so if the weight between X and Y is large, we assume that f of x is not very different from, from f of y. The sum of the dif squared differences of the values between two points that are related has to be smaller than r. So this in implies that your function is smooth with respect to the structure of the graph. Okay? So if two points here, x and y are close, uh, their values have to be different, they have not to be too different. And uh, well, in that case, the set of functions we are considering is the set of all functions on the k points, the k uh, vertices of the graph, for which we have this uh, constraint, this, uh, this smoothness constraint, and we can prove similar results on the expectation of the stopping time of, uh, uh, of any uh, delta correct uh, strategy. 
very similar to, to what we had before, just an expression that is a bit particular for the alternative set here. We have to restrict to a set of functions that are R smooth. And uh, this has been extended to a pack optimization. So when we have an epsilon and we are okay with epsilon correct answer. Um, computing the complexity term in that case is not very, uh, is not as straightforward as, as in the previous case. So computing the max mean problem is not uh, completely trivial, but uh, we have a mirror ascent algorithm in uh, the paper that explains how to do it pretty efficiently. That is uh, at a rate for, that we control. So for optimization, from an optimization point of view, it is a slow rate, but for us it is sufficient to uh, what, uh, what are our needs. Uh, the algorithm looks like this, so maybe I don't have to go into the details now. And uh, we can uh, prove that uh, indeed, uh, well, there was no state of the art for this problem, but we could compare the, the empirical uh, uh, complexity we found with the theoretical view and, and uh, show that there is a good match between the two. Um, now, let's conclude with uh, what we were initially interested in. That is to say, what if we have a continuous function? Well, in that case, we may discretize the function, and then uh, we have a graph. Uh, if the function is uh, R2, say it's a, it's a, it's a grid. Um, and uh, we may encode the regularity of the function f in different ways. Uh, the first idea might be to consider that it is Lipschitz. In that case, two points that are closed have a difference of value that is bounded by a fixed value. The second idea is to have such an energy condition, which is exactly the limit when the grid uh, gets more fine and fine of the uh, graph uh, regularity condition we had before. Okay, we were summing the squared norm of f of x minus f of, f of a minus f of b. So when we take the limit a and b going to zero and rescale correctly, what we get is a, con is a constraint of, uh, on uh, the integral of the uh, squared norm of the gradient of f. Okay, so the class of function we are considering by, uh, we can consider this kind of, uh, of function. And when we discretize, we obtain a uh, result that is, uh, we obtain a graph problem with a graph constraint just as the one we had seen before. And the question is, uh, okay, so we can apply our algorithm, but uh, what happens to our algorithm? What happens to the complexity when the grid gets uh, finer and finer? Can we find a limit? And what can we say on a, so we had said that uh, our algorithm was associated with an optimal frequency of draws of each point. So that's uh, what I was saying uh, here, here, that uh, the omega stars, the omegas in the realizing the maximum here correspond to optimal frequency of draw of all the arms. So how does it translate in the continuous case? Do we see an optimal uh, frequency of draws appearing on the grid that would have some kind of property of convergence? when we go to the limit and uh, that we might lead to an optimal uh, density of uh, draws that would be necessary to identify as soon as possible the maximum of the function in uh, a continuous setting. So that's, that is still a work in progress. In fact, we don't know. We have uh, made some uh, numerical experiments on this, but we have no, no theory so far that permits to, to really uh, show uh, what happens in, in, a, in the case of a refined grid. We have some, uh, some results that are encouraging and some not. For example, this is a simulation where we have a, a function and these are the optimal weights. And we see that there, there seem to be a, a delta mass and the maximum in the limit, which is not what we would like to, to see, of course. Okay, well, and that will be uh, my last word. So thanks for your attention. Yes. 
Can you repeat a little uh, louder? So please? these information theoretic lower bounds can be used even in the non-sequential setting, right? In the fixed budget setting. Okay. Yes, in a batch setting, it's uh, very interesting. So uh, here I proposed everything in a in, inter, in a sequential setting, but actually, uh, what could be said even from uh, for this problem, for this simple testing problem uh, here, in a batch setting. So actually, uh, yes, uh, uh, the lower bound technique with the change of measure applies and leads the same quantity. But this quantity is not optimal in the batch case. It's not optimal by a factor of four. I can show you. In that case, for example, well, if you just consider the simple testing problem, mu equals epsilon versus mu equals minus epsilon, you can compute the Neiman percent uh, test and look exactly at its complexity. You will find that its complexity, it's um, eight time uh, uh, sigma squared divide. Uh, no, uh, sorry, it's. Uh, 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 where is it? Yes, it's here. Uh, the true complexity, batch complexity of this problem is this one, whereas the sequential complexity of this problem is that one. And uh, the lower bound we obtain by information is the same for the batch and for the uh, sequential setting, which amounts to saying that this information technique gives the lower bound with the right constant for the sequential setting, but uh, Pessimist, uh, pessimistic lower bound for the batch setting by a factor of four. And I don't know how to informationally, with purely informational theoretical bounds, obtain the true uh, bound for the batch, lower bound for the batch setting. A side message is that in this case, there is a gap of four in the, the number of samples you need uh, between the batch setting and the sequential setting. So you can have the same level of confidence with four times fewer observations on average if you allow for a sequential test instead of a batch test. And these graphs explain it in a way. Question. Um, in the last setting, when you had a continuous function, does one need to discretize or can you just do something in the continuous space, you know, the whole of lower bound analysis and the algorithm? So, uh, yes, uh, I don't know how to tackle it uh, completely generally. So what should be a sampling rule? What should be an alternative in the without uh, discretization? Uh, as I should, I, I consider this as a progressively <laughs> uh, complexity improving set of uh, problems. And I was uh, at each step trying to rely on what was done before in order to solve it. So I'm, I thought maybe going through discretization and having a, a, refine, a grid finite and finite might be lead to the answer, but I don't know. There's maybe a pass. I don't know, in fact, if we can address it directly, and uh, that would be very interesting, of course. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so how does it compare to the exam banded literature where they assume that the near optimality dimension is very small and they do some uh, adaptive research and so on, right? So. How does your graph Lapla Laplacian regularity compared to that assumption? So ah, it's not so clear. Yeah, okay. So it's a pretty different line of work. So some people not caring about uh, lower bounds, but uh, rather on the upper bounds have designed methods like SO, uh, HO, DO, things like algorithms like this that uh, often are based on the sequential partitioning of the space and for which they obtain guarantees either in terms of regret, simple or, or, uh, or cumulated regret. Uh, and uh, they express it. They express the difficulty of the optimization problems in terms of the so, um, near optimality dimension, which counts how much mass there is that is close to optimal. Um, it would be interesting to to compare uh, the two settings, uh, but clearly uh, this is a smoothness condition, and it doesn't compare the near optimality uh, dimension. In particular, those algorithms that require some um, some regularity just around the maximum, whereas here there's a global, very global uh, um, smoothness condition. So uh, it doesn't compare directly, but uh, yes, uh, the hope is that the, the kind of methods we obtain like this uh, are better than, than those who are, well, those HO and so on are tackling directly the upper bound without having any idea of the lower bound. So uh, 
It would be a miracle if they could match the lower bound. I would be very happy, but it would really seem like a miracle. Okay, so the no more questions. Let's thank the speaker uh, again. So we'll meet at 4.30 for the next talk.
what is okay so put it in my pocket works Hi everyone. Um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, L.A. Prashant, who's a faculty member at uh, Computer Science Department in IIT Madras. He his work he works mainly on theoretical reinforcement learning, and he'll be talking today about uh, some of his new bounds on um, uh, TD learning with linear function approximation, which uh, where we can set uh, uh, you know parameter free learning rates. Uh, now over to Prashant. Thanks, uh, Dheeraj, for the introduction, and thanks to organizers for this opportunity. I understand this is the last talk, so there'll be some comic interludes to keep you awake. And uh, it's raining outside, so you can't escape in case you have such thoughts. <laughs> uh, so just pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there, is, there is some connection to these punchlines uh, to what I'm going to present to TD learning. Uh, TD learning is a very popular algorithm for prediction, and uh, it also does a lot of pretension that it's doing the right thing. So it's important to you that you pretend well. And this work is joint work with Gandharv and uh, Dina who are at uh, McGill and Dheeraj who is at Google and also here. Uh, let's get started. So I'll have the fastest introduction to temporal difference learning. Uh, I'm assuming many of you know, for those of you who don't know, just uh, treat it as some uh, ideas for non-asymptotic bonds for linear stochastic approximation which uh, these ideas will carry over in that setting as well, uh, even if you don't know the specifics of TD. So you look. Uh, so the setting we have is sequential decision making and uncertainty. The formalism is Markov decision processes, and the in, you know in the important components are you have states, actions, cost or reward based on your view of things, uh, and the state transitions uh, leading to a Markov chain. And the outcomes are uncertain, uh, both uh, cost or rewards and the state transitions. And the objective is to minimize some kind of a cumulative uh, sum of your costs or rewards. And what you have control over is the actions that you choose in any given state, and you can randomize. Uh, and here is an example, uh, which is like driving to work, uh, just to keep uh, get audience engagement. What would be a good uh, thing to put in the state variable? Any ideas? What should be in the state? You're going to work. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, that's interesting, right? Uh, I did this in February also. <laughs> uh, this example in, in the context of, of different talks. But what's the most important state variable that you think about? Sorry? Can somebody be loud? Or I think Mode of transport, yes, but yes, <laughs> that's the most important. Where you are, before we, where you want to get to, your position is the most important, whether you're flying or driving or you know, whatever. I think position is the most important state variable. And uh, your actions could be whether you want to take the highway or the local roads. Or uh, in Bangalore, we call this highways as ring roads, outer ring road and outer to outer ring road, and all the ring roads where the rings keep extending. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you, you could have other uh, you know actions also. I won't delve deeper into this example, but uh, just to get audience awake, I got this. So the important uh, performance metric is value function, which is a sum. I'll stick to rewards henceforth. So you keep summing these rewards, add a discount, and look at it in the infinite horizon. And the important control that you have is over actions, and I choose actions, so pi is my policy. This pi can be deterministic, which is like saying that given a state, I will always choose a particular action, or it could be a distribution over actions. In either case, you want to you know, optimize this expected value. And uh, 
for a given policy, I mean, uh, a bigger problem in RL is the problem of control where you want to find the best policy which has the best value function. In this talk, we are not going to focus on that. In this talk, we are going to fix the policy and try to estimate this. That's the goal of this talk. And uh, an important tool for the algorithm that will be presented next is that this fixed point equation. So this V pi is the one and only fixed point of this operator. It's the one and only fixed point of operator, which is like saying that V pi equals T pi V pi. And this, this is what is exploited in arriving at uh, the temporal difference learning. Uh, so which is the topic of next slide. So if I want to do whatever is called as the tabular uh, TD0, uh, I'm just focusing on TD0. Uh, tabular TD0, what I do is uh, uh, I get rid of this P and sample from this, sample and X state, treat this as the increment. And that's here for you. And this is where the pretension bit is coming. So you're going to pretend that this VT is the V pi, in which case you'll have a mean zero term. And uh, this under some reasonable assumption, uh, very, you know, converges to V pi, this iterate. Uh, this is just a stochastic approximation uh, which solves the fixed point equation in the previous slide. And what is the problem with this? The problem is that you need to store a huge table. Yeah, you need to store a lookup table. And one way to get rid of it uh, is to come up with some approximation to the function that you care about, which is the value function, which is TD with linear function approximation. So you approximate the function that you care about using a linear architecture. And theta is your parameter, uh, phi is the features. And both of these sit in a smaller dimensional you know, space, D. Where D is much smaller than the cardinality of the state space. Now the question is, uh, what is the theta that I have to choose? Uh, what TD does is uh, it solves what is called as the projected uh, Bellman equation or projected uh, fixed point equation here. And some notation here, this is a very, very tall matrix. So uh, to put things in context, so TD gets to this theta star doesn't solve this projected system of equations by writing it as like a linear system of equations and explicitly solving it. What it does is instead, you know, indirectly gets there via sampling. And this phi is a tall matrix with rows for each state. You stack up the features uh, as rows. And then uh, you project orthogonally using a certain weighted L2 norm. Theta is your operator. And theta star is what you want to get to. So that's a reasonable approximation to the Bellman equation or fixed point equation. Previously you had V pi equals T pi V pi, but you need the projection because you know the actual value function V pi may not be expressible in this form. Maybe you don't have rich features on, you know, things like that. So you can only hope to solve a projected system of equations. If value function is expressible in some phi theta star form, then this projection is going to go away. Otherwise, you're going to get an approximation and uh, you're going to get an approximation error. Yeah. Any questions? This is all still in the background. Uh, I didn't uh, do any of this. Uh, some more background before I get to the main contribution. So this is the algorithm. You have, it's a stochastic approximation algorithm with a certain step size and an update. This has some similarity to whatever I presented as full state TD. So this was the value at the next state. This was the value at the current state. And this entire thing is a scalar, whereas theta is a vector. So I just people throw in this phi of st. But uh, if you just take this entire shaded term and compute its uh, expectation or the mean value, then what you get is an equation which would be equivalent to the uh, TD fixed point that I gave, projected TD fixed point. That would be an interesting exercise. That's the first exercise I suggest you do before getting into TD to believe why this, or to understand or make sense of this update rule. Uh, in particular, this increment, you have to relate this increment to this fixed point relation. Once you do that, then you can start analyzing TD because if you don't, can't make sense of, okay, I hope you can make sense of it. Okay, so under some assumptions, so the question now is, does this TD update, uh, this iterate converge to theta star? And are what kinds of assumptions? You need some assumptions. So the first assumption is that the Markov chain, if you fix the action, what you see is a sequence of states and that's a Markov chain. And that Markov chain we assume has a stationary distribution. And this is simple, yeah, any questions? Okay, so this is, uh, you know, if you have a finite uh, state action MDP, then this is equivalent to assuming the reducibility. Yeah, every state is accessible from every other state. So this assumption is common. The second assumption is that, you know, 
the features are uh, good enough in the sense that you have uh, the feature matrix, the tall matrix as full column rank. You don't have redundancy in the feature matrix. The columns are not depend, linearly dependent. So once you have that, an important quantity comes into picture, which is the minimum eigenvalue of this matrix, and that will be greater than zero. Is Xi is the is a diagonal matrix where you put all the stationary distribution entries, and you look at the lambda min of this, and that will be strictly greater than zero if you assume full column rank, all right? The next things are simplifying assumptions that we make in our work, uh, but uh, you can throw in integrability assumptions uh, uh, in general. Uh, we make this work for the sake of simplicity. Assume the rewards are all bounded by one and features are uh, bounded by one in norm, uh, in L2 norm. You can replace this with constants and adjust the bounds. You can read the paper we have. Uh, for simplicity, I'm putting one here. And these are standard stochastic approximation conditions. And the most difficult assumption is coming next, uh, which is uh, some mixing assumptions, uh, which put some bounds on mixing. Uh, because the Markov chain, when you start TD with linear function approximation, will have an initial distribution. It will mix, and then the projected TD fixed point will have the stationary distribution, whereas you're not sampling from the stationary distribution. So you need some boundedness assumptions here. And are all of these assumptions, I'm going to uh, skip through this because this is uh, uh, not very important for today's talk. Uh, what happens is it's cyclic and Van Roy in a landmark paper showed uh, uh, a while ago that uh, the TD iterate converges to the theta star, uh, which is part of the projected TD fixed point. And this theta star can be written like this. It's a solution to a linear system of equations. And uh, this is the A matrix and this is the B matrix. Important thing is I cannot solve this directly in an RL setting because I don't know the stationary distribution. I don't know the transition probability matrix. And even if I know, I'm looking at a high dimensional system. Yeah. So in any case, it's uh, it makes sense to have efficient stochastic approximation schemes, even if you know all the quantities. And so that's what TD does. Yeah. And it can be cast into the general linear stochastic approximation. Uh, you know, algorithm, and uh, you can understand it from that context. So all this is history. Any questions? Okay, so uh, some more quotes just to wake you up. Uh, so what happens? Asymptotically, something good happens, but uh, we have to figure out what happens when I implement TD algorithm. If I run it for 100 steps, is it good? Run it for 1,000, what step sizes to use? Things like that. And so what happens in the short run of TD0? And a high level summary. So stay with me at least for the summary. In case you have forgotten, TD fixed point is this, which is the same as this A theta star equals B. These two are equivalent. And this is the algorithm that I'm looking at. And I want bounds like this. These are the non asymptotic bounds I care about. I'm looking at a bound in expectation and I'm looking also at a high confidence interval. I want these bounds. So for this, uh, under the assumptions that Sitsiklis and Van Roy made, can I specify the step sizes and maybe other parameters of the algorithm if I throw them in and get rates like this? That's really the question that we are looking at. Is the premise clear? So I think it will be forgotten. The bounds will have it. I am giving a, when I present the bounds, I'll present it as two terms where there'll be something that depends on the initial error I thought this was too early to make the <laughs> bounds go the. <laughs> yeah, initial error is usually forgotten faster. Yeah. Sorry, what? If you, I mean, in the old school day when I was doing this, uh, if you're hand coding the features, the bound on the features is apparent. You know how much, what's the maximum norm of that. But uh, if you're using a box, then uh, you'll have to check with the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's a bound on the features. Like, you know what each bit of the feature is like, what is the range? So if you know that, and if it's a D-dimensional feature, you can bound. And that's as well. Like each bit, if it is in some range, then you know that. You know the bound, and it's d, d, d bits. Yeah, you're not growing the features; you're fixing it to d dimensional, d dimensional vectors. And if you know each coordinate, the range, then you can bound it. Yeah. Because that's the L2 norm. Yeah. 
any other questions yeah so far i'm not presented anything that i did yeah okay let's see some more high level things about high level summary so i want like this and the question is you know whenever i mean if you have looked at stochastic gradient algorithms uh, when you try to analyze uh, pranit was here if you look at his papers for instance you have uh, you have half a dozen options at least three options less than half a dozen but one of them is you run it for t steps and pick the last iterate last iterate is theta t and then give bounds for theta t that's the first thing the second thing is the other popular iterate averaging goes back to polyak and rupert you pick the average iterate you take all the iterates and average them and in our work uh, we have a variation to that which is like uh, tail averaging which is like you don't start the averaging from the first point you start it after a while you start it after a while and only average the tail yeah it's like like that last 10% if you have if you visited iterates theta 1 through theta 100 maybe i'll just average the last 20 iterates yeah theta 80 81 to theta 100 i won't average the first 80 uh, intuitive idea is like the algorithm may start at a very bad point so it does not make sense to consider averaging from the very beginning and the in theory also will show that that's that intuition carries through and even the bounds say the same story all right sometimes you know for the high priority bounds alone i'll project and this is somewhat uh, dicey in the sense that you know the region of projection should contain theta star otherwise my bounds i mean the you know the theory whatever we propose breaks down and this is problematic because you are trying to get to theta star so you don't know where it lies so you cannot find a box or a ball which lies in it but uh, at least uh, as a first exploration in theory you know this is there are many papers on td which do this so it's not a solo crime <laughs> uh, but at least in expectation i don't project let's put it that way there are enough bounds where they, we take vanilla td and give bounds for the tail average iterate we don't need projection we don't need to know a box where the theta star lives yeah but for high priority bounds it's probably an artifact of proof technique at some point we'll fix it the bonds for td under iid sampling yeah so what's there on the next slide yeah it's a joke yeah i think post covid uh, it's i think uh, difficult to sit through an entire day of talks <laughs> and uh, i am surprised everyone is awake yeah thanks <laughs> thanks thanks for all the good manners we'll go on yeah what is iid sampling yeah so the iid sampling is this for the sake of analysis what we do assume is if you look at the td update what you need is the current state the reward and the next state you want this three tuple yeah if i have these three quantities then i take the features for each of this take the reward and i update the parameter now what i assume for the analysis for a contribution is that this is sampled from this distribution where i pick the state using the stationary distribution and i pick the next state using the transition probability map of the marco chain underlying policy pi yeah so for the analysis this is what we do if you read the paper we had a marco noise extension where we don't have this but first we derive bound for this iid sampling and then handle marco noise and add the mixing term but in the end if you look at the bounds here there's already something useful and i'll also manifest a setting where iid sampling makes perfect sense it's not something just that i could derive a fancy theorem a non asymptotic bound and publish a paper it also makes sense in practice i can use iid sampling in a variation of td to solve something called ls td i'll get to that application later yeah. okay so iid sampling if you have seen uh, the bounds uh, in one of my earlier work uh, it would be interesting to check that work when i submitted it and when i published it and, uh, here i'll tell you what that work is this work 2021 <laughs> just uh, for curiosity just read the first paper footnote when i submitted when i got it published yeah and then talk to me i'll tell you the back story yeah. uh, because on record i can't say that <laughs> uh, so the point is in this work what we looked i mean if you're trying to derive a bound for a stochastic approximation algorithm the first thing at least i thought should be tried as a diminishing step size which is inversely proportional like this goes down with t and the most important part is this minimum i can value minimum positive i can value assuming this this you will get if you assume the features 
a full column rank, you'll get a minimum positive eigenvalue. And so this step size constant depends on inversely, is inversely proportional to the minimum eigenvalue. And then I'll get the best rates. These rates that I wanted, I will obtain it. Yeah. And what is the problem with this? Yeah, we don't know mu. Yeah, we don't know mu. That's the problem. Okay. We don't know mu. So henceforth, what I'll say is if I have an algorithm which you know which requests knowledge of mu, I'll call it non-universal step size. And if it does not have this problematic dependence, it's a universal step size. Yeah. So you can get to a universal step size with what is called as iterate averaging. It goes back to Polak and Rupert. I think they were at least four years or six years apart. Yeah, I think Rupert had it in 1988. Polak is 92, I think. Yeah. Uh, the same work, yeah. uh, same idea. So here, what you do is you don't you take bigger steps, still diminishing but bigger steps. Alpha is between half and one, but bigger steps, and then you average. And there's no for any c. The bound the constants will have c, but c uh, is not uh, restricted to you know c greater than one by mu and things like that. You don't need knowledge of mu. Okay, the flip side is that I won't get one by square root t, but I'll get something which is almost one by square root. I can take alpha arbitrary close to one, but it has to be strictly less than one. I can't put alpha equals one because all these constants will blow up. And I'll get a very trivial bound. So that's, uh, I mean, if you looked at this, this is some from my paper in machine learning journal. Uh, I'm going to give out, it took seven years. I submitted in 2014, yeah. I'll reveal more, yeah. Uh, and I moved between two continents and got two kids in between. <laughs> and all the other co-authors also, yeah, anyway. <laughs> we went through, changed two jobs, had two kids and actually got one paper. Yeah. Anyway, this didn't take that long. This took one year, yeah. This is a start, it started a year ago. Uh, so the main message from this AI starts paper uh, is that I can get one by square root. I can get one by square root t with tail averaging. I can get it. And uh, this is the bound. So what is tail averaging? If you see here, this definition, please pay attention. The point is I'm visiting theta one through theta t. Yeah, and I'm averaging the last n iterate. So I'm starting from point k and averaging all these iterates in the end. So the number of iterates I'm averaging is this. Okay, as inspiration, this was inspired by some work uh, where I think Praneet was one of the authors. Uh, I, think, I don't remember the, all the other co-authors. We did something like this for least squares regression and with a lot of effort and jugglery, we got a similar idea to work in TD. Yeah, we got a similar work idea to work uh, in TD, this tail averaging idea, and I can get these two, yeah? So that's the main message. Uh, there's one more message after this, and then if you get bored, you can zone out or stick through the details. Yeah. Important thing is this is a universal step size. I only need to know the discount factor and the bound on the features. I don't need to know mu. So the idea is I'm taking constant steps, which in some sense are like bigger steps, and I'm averaging, but I'm not averaging from the beginning. I'm averaging the last few tricks. So that's really the idea. And then some algebraic uh, tricks brought us to this bound. Yeah. That's the first message. And uh, Second message is we can regularize the problem and you know hope uh, we'll get better results or better bounds on some problem instances. That's the second message. So instead of solving theta star equals A inverse B, which is the vanilla TD solution, I'll regularize, I'll throw in a lambda and I'll still do the constant step size and do the tail averaging and I'll get a bound. And this bound has constants which scale better with the underlying eigenvalues for the regularized case, at least on a few MDPs. Yeah, we, manu we manufactured one such example in the paper. So it helps to regularize, not just to achieve a global, you know, or universal step size, but also to get better dependence on the underlying eigenvalues. That's something that's going to come next. So these are the main two messages. Now I'll go elaborate all of these. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah, that's correct. Huh. 
Yeah, both in expectation and with high confidence. Both, both, and I'll take, take lambda equals one by square root t and get a bound from here to the theta star itself. No, here the goal is just getting one by square root t rate. Yeah, so if you look at this, if I solve the ridge regression problem, and if I do TD, a modified version of TD, its limit is, it's a stochastic approximation algorithm, which will get to this theta star rig. And this theta star rig is order of lambda away. And if I want order of one by square root T rate overall, I'll just put lambda equals one by square root T. I have a global, I have a universal step size. I have one by square root T convergence. So the point is, okay, the first, so the point is, if you look at the dependence, if you do full iterate averaging, uh, if you, I'll come to the bounds later, then the initial error is something like theta naught, wherever I start, minus theta star. That's, that's the initial error. It depends on where I started. That will be forgotten at a certain rate, one by n, one by n square or e exponential. Here, with tail averaging, we're able to forget it exponentially fast. Compared to full averaging, because you may start at a very bad point. So it makes sense to average after a while. Yeah, probably that's one way of looking at it. But if you do just do gradient descent, right? Uh, your limit may be a point which is very far from where you started. So the wherever initial exploration you do, you do may not be necessary in your final iterate that you're proposing. In the end, you are saying this is the iterate. This is what I think is a proxy for theta star. So in that, it doesn't make sense to put all those initial points, which may be arbitrarily far. That's just the intuition. But uh, if you look at the bounds, the initial error is forgotten exponentially fast. I think in the next 15 minutes, I hope to get there. Yeah. Okay, so this is a huge summary. Uh, so the point is, uh, in all these previous works, uh, they either got one by square root t knowing mu, or got a weaker rate, or got a weaker rate, yeah, something like one by t power alpha by two. So we managed to able to close the gap using tail averaging, and also with regularization, we'll show some benefits. And this is the story with expectation. There are small. And this is the vanilla TD, and here with uh, projection, we are able to achieve something similar. Yeah. Uh, there are fewer papers who do high confidence bounds, uh, and even there, uh, we are able to get the one by square root T rate for units. That's really the message. Okay, we'll go on. So the point is uh, the ID assumption. The ID sampling assumption makes sense in a setting that I'm going to talk about in the same paper where I talked. Uh, um, so TD on a batch. So people might have seen this LSTD algorithm, which is like you collect a bunch of samples like this, state, reward, and next state, and solve this linear system. Okay. And if you use the incremental inverse computation, Sherman, Morrison, Lama, or Woodbury's identity, however you knew it, and if these features are all d-dimensional, then this computation, computing this AT bar inverse, yeah, this one is like order d square t, where t is the number of samples size of the data set. Now what you can do is instead of solving this explicitly, you, okay, it's part of, uh, you know, so LSTD is part of uh, policy iteration type algorithms where you'll do LSTD and then do the policy improvement and again do LSTD and do policy improvement, something like LSPI and some variants. So this D square T, the question is, can I do DT, order of D times T? It makes sense, uh, at least for example, long back when I did this work, I think computer go had features which was 10 power six, yeah, 10 power six, yeah. After that, I have not looked at the feature dimension yet. So, so the question is, can I reduce to order of DT? And the idea is here. So what I'm doing here is something like TD, but on the batch. I have T sample transitions. I'll pick uniformly one of them at random and do my update, got it? So this is like, so if I replace this by, you know, stationary, you know, stationary or IID sampling, then I get the vanilla, you know, the TD that I was talking about. Here I have T sample transitions. I'll pick one uniformly and random and run through this. And so this will converge to the LSTD solution. And it's a perfect, so if you do this uh, update from right to left, this is order of D update. 
And if you do it t times, then in order of d, so the complexity is order of d times do t per iteration. And if you do t rounds, t updates, then it's order of d times t. And if you invert explicitly, it's order d squared t. And if I show that after t steps, this is very close, then this is a good enough proxy. I will gain computational efficiency and also not lose anything in theory. Yeah. So that's really the idea. So I run TD on a batch. So that's where, you know, ID sampling makes sense. So here is a perfectly practical setting. And this is somewhat inspired by what you do with SGD. Instead of directly solving uh, theta equals some A inverse B, you pick those instances. Only issue is here, you're doing something with TD with matrices which are not symmetric, which involves a lot more work. Yeah. Any questions on this? Uh, this is called pathways LSTD. Yeah. Pathways LSTD and its TD variant. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. So that's entirely orthogonal to this work. That's my answer. <laughs> in the sense, I'm not doing any feature in your given. So the question is this, you're given a bunch of features. And you want to learn the best parameter if you go to TD with linear function approximation. So if you go back a long, 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 long way. Yeah, so, so I'm going to fix the features. After that, it's entirely interesting to figure what is the best theta. And, given, and uh, that best theta turns out to be, I mean, uh, that reasonable theta turns out to be this. And now I have to get to this theta star without too much computation. That's like the basis of TD with linear function approximation. How you get the features, how you optimize them, whether you're going to do some low dimensional projection, low rank approximation. Like for example, you could take that feature matrix and you know do SVD and cut it, truncate and do all of that. You can do all that. You give me the features. After that, I'll try to get to theta stuff. These are two independent problems. Where was I? I did the batch. Yeah. So for this, I mean, for this TD on a batch and our bounded features, bounded rewards, and this minimum eigenvalue assumption, I get these bonds where I require this mu. With knowledge of mu, which is like C greater than 1 by mu, I get 1 by square root T, right? And then if I do iterate averaging, I'll get uh, a weaker rate. Yeah, I'm going to skip that. But the point is, the question remains, can I get one by square root t without knowing b? And that gap is closed by TD with tail average. That's the gap. That's the gap we closed. We didn't change the algorithm. It's the same TD algorithm. We added tail averaging instead of full averaging or the last iterate. And we were able to get the bonds. Yeah, in between something. But when I was coming to Bangalore, my daughter asked me, where are you going? Why are you going? And things like that. Anyway, so in case you have forgotten, this is IID sampling. So I have a bunch of, uh, you know, I have tuples like this, state, reward, and next state, where the actions are chosen according to a policy which is fixed. You have the stationary distribution and this P. So the point is you're given a bunch of samples like this, and you're going to use that to update TD. You can look at the paper for the Marco noise extension, but uh, uh, the question of whether I need to know mu, whether I can get the algorithm, are entirely interesting even in the IID setting. The Marconos is something like a technical, I would say it's like a technical extension. The idea about getting rid of mu is more important. Getting rid of mu dependence. Okay, some more summary, which is, you know, this is the TD algorithm. This is the fixed point I want to get to. And the step size that I chose is like this. And this is the tail averaging. The important thing is like I'm averaging last 10 iterates. Averaging the last n iterates starting from point k. Okay. Yeah. And assumptions as before, features bounded, rewards bounded, uh, feature matrix as full column rank, and the Marco chain is irreducible. We, for simplicity, I am assuming it is finite state actions. You can extend it to more countable state spaces easily. There are two eigenvalues that come into picture. I want you to remember, but I'll try to recall it many more times. So if feature matrix P has full column rank, this matrix A plus A transpose, A is not symmetric. If you look at uh, the PD fixed point, it's like A theta star equals B. A is not a symmetric matrix. 
A plus A transpose will have a minimum positive eigenvalue if the feature matrix P has full column rank. And also this matrix, this matrix will have another minimum positive value. I'll call it mu and mu prime. And we look at this mu and mu prime uh, in the bounds at some point. This is the correct time. So five ten. Yeah. I have ten more minutes. Okay. Oh. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so with tail averaging, I get this bound. And I want to spend some time here. I'll spend five minutes on this and five minutes on another side. And that will and one minute on the questions. That will cover eleven minutes. This is the step size. If there's a bound on the features that will come here, I'm assuming features norm is bounded by one, otherwise they'll come here. And beta is the discount factor, that's easy to assume. Uh, uh, assume knowledge of beta. And to answer somebody's question, this is the initial error, theta naught minus theta star. And if you, if you look at this term, for simplicity, I assume I'm starting averaging after a half tape. Yeah? Just to illustrate how things, how these bounds, how this bound looks. Then what happens is this, this is like one by T. This is the term that relates to a certain variance that comes in the update factor. And the initial error, if you look at this, this K is the midway point. Yeah, this will be T by two. So this is like E power minus T divided by T square. So if you look at the initial term, it's forgotten exponentially fast. Yeah, so you're forgetting the initial point wherever you started for this algorithm exponentially fast because you're doing tail averaging, you're not considering all the points initially. So even if you start averaging halfway from the halfway point, the initial error gets forgotten exponentially fast and the dominant term will be this term which has this variance for the update factor. Yeah, so this will be one by T. So I get one by T rate. So previously I wanted one by square root T without the square. So if you take square root throughout, get this up. Get rid of the square, you'll get one by square. Questions? Is this bound clear? Because after this, I'll have variations of this bound. Yeah, that, so the point is there are two ways to derive these bounds. And if you have a problem which is ill-conditioned, where mu is really small, then you can derive a bound, which is like one by t power one by four, instead of one by square root t. Get rid of the square you get one by t power one by four. No eigenvalue, inverse eigenvalue dependence. Okay. The other way is this where the eigenvalue comes in. So you can have one proof technique to get rid of this eigenvalue dependence, but the rate will be slower. But that will hold for every problem. Whether the mu is small, big, whatever. But if mu is reasonable, then this mu relates to how the features. So that feature matrix, whatever columns you put there, there's a lot of redundancy, the mu will be small. Yeah, so. Yeah, uh, but the, you want to add something? So, so the point is, it really depends on the domain and how you chose features. So if you're not really sure about mu, uh, use the other one. <laughs> yeah. With a different step size. That's that's <laughs> it's the most practical. But if you know some um, lower and upper bound from you, yes, you can. Also, there is uh, some work which shows that okay, if you use STD style algorithms, it's adaptive. So if you choose a step size which is not too bad, if you have strong convexity, like mu being the largest strong convexity, essentially, it adapts and gives you one over n rate. But if it's not big enough, it will give you one over root n rate. So, yeah, that's the gap. I'm saying that's the gap. Yeah. yeah so, but yeah, it is usually if you do the analysis the right way, you can show that it adapts. You don't have to change the algorithm. It just gives you the right best of the two worlds. Yeah. No, this whatever analysis can be loosely correlated with doing SGD with strong convexity, very loosely. Yeah. Anyway, similar high probability bond, if you're super interested about the constant, I didn't want to scare anyone, so you can look at the paper. Yeah. The next thing I want to show is regularization. Where does regularization help? Does it even make sense to regularize? And so in case you have forgotten, I'm solving this with a particular lambda. And if I solve this, then the update rule will feature a lambda. So 
So the update will change because I'm doing regularized TD. I want to get there. This algorithm will get to theta star. But the question is whether the distance from this iterate to the theta star, which is vanilla TD's theta star without uh, regularization, will it be of the order one by square root t? If it is of the order one by square root t, why should I use regularization? These are the two questions to handle in the next six minutes. And here again, we choose a universal step size. We have not lost the universal step size with regularization. For any given lambda, this is the step size. And for that, we get a bound like this. If you look at this bound, again, I'll get the one by t overall bound. Get the one by t overall bound. But the important thing to focus on is this scales inversely with mu square, one by mu square. Whereas the previous one was one by one minus beta times mu prime square. Okay, so that's the difference. So the scaling is with different eigenvalues. One is of the A matrix, if you remember, A plus A transpose, which goes into the TD fixed point. The other is of the feature matrix, phi transpose phi. So the question is, which is better? So I'll put these two bounds side by side. This one last note, so this is for any lambda. So if I want to, so this is the tail averaged regularized iterate to theta star. So just put a hat here. I forgot to put the hat. And uh, this bound is to theta star. This is not theta star reg, but to theta star. Okay. This is not the regularized TD solution, but this is the vanilla TD fixed point. So this difference is of order. If I take n equals t by two again for illustration, I'll get order one by t. I'll get order one by t in either case. So is there any reason to use this bound over the other? And the answer is okay. Let me put these two bounds side by side. This is without regularization. This is with regularization. If you look at this, it's one minus beta times mu prime square. And here I get mu square. So the thing is, what we show, what we show here is in the paper, we show an instance where we show that this can be arbitrarily small as compared to this. You can make one minus beta times mu prime arbitrarily small by tweaking a Markov chain. You can look at the counter example in the paper. So I have problem instances where one minus beta times mu prime is very small compared to mu. Uh, in that situation, even though the dependence on t is the same, it makes sense to use this bound with regularization because the scaling is better. So you can look at, I'm not discussing that counter example in detail here, uh, but I, the, bound, the example is in the paper. So any questions on this? We also derived high probability bounds, but I'm not uh, I'm going to bulldoze you with all the bounds. If this work is even remotely interesting, please read the paper. No, this is without regularization. These are different iterates. So if you want, you can put a start at the same point. Yeah. The point is this inverse scaling. There's a factor that will dominate. If mu, you know, if one minus beta times mu prime is very small, then this factor will dominate. Yeah. Whereas here we are saying that we have a we have problem instances where one minus beta times mu prime is much smaller than mu. So with regularization, I can get a better bound. Even on problem instances where one minus beta times mu prime is very small. Because on such things, mu, mu need not be small. We manufactured such a problem instance to give the motivation for regularization. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, I think uh, from a theory, I can say that if you take any constant fraction, uh, last 25%, 50%, and so on, uh, it's okay. You should not average from the beginning. But empirically, I don't know. We didn't do any experiments in this paper. <laughs> yeah, here, if you take any proportion in theory wise, it's okay. Uh, as I said, I can't, without doing experiments, I don't want to. Uh, claim anything, but I think any last person, last, uh, uh, you know, last person at 10, 20 or things like that should work. Uh, maybe in six months, if uh, Gandhav does some experiments, uh, I'll let you know. But the important thing is, there are two things. You don't pick the last iterate. The bounds are bad. And don't average from the beginning. So you have to average after a while. And that message is true even, you know, like if you compare the bounds for last iterate versus iterate averaging. Yeah, the last iterate, the initial error is forgotten super fast. But then for the last iterate to get the right bound, you need to know mu. With iterate averaging, you don't have that, but initial error is forgotten 
slowly. So with tail averaging, you get the best, so best of both worlds. You'll forget the initial error fast, and you don't need to know mu. You get best of both worlds, but when to start averaging empirically, uh, I don't have an answer. No, by choosing the step size, what? Huh. Yeah, that's for non-smooth problems. This is like smooth. No, but here you need to, I'm saying you need to know mu. It's like strongly convex problems. It's like strong convexity, I would say, yeah. So, yeah, I'll have to discuss off this, yeah. <laughs> In the interest of time. I'm done, I'll end with a joke. I usually don't like to conclude my talk. I mean, I like to conclude without conclusions. Uh, but I realize that some reviewers don't like it when I submit it to ICML New Rips without conclusions. Some reviewers were uh, <laughs> unhappy. So I took the abstract and made past tense out of it. <laughs> but yeah, uh, if you like to read more, read these two papers. Thanks. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Lambda is one by square root t. So no, see there you are trying to solve with a fixed data set. Here it's a running problem, you're sampling. So I think they cannot be strictly compared. See the point is. There's an algorithm which asymptotically gets somewhere, yeah, theta star, and I want to get there in the finite regime, and I want to see what kind of step size I can choose so that I get the best rate. So uh, I don't know if there's a strict parallel. Yeah. Yeah, let me put it this way. For any stochastic approximation algorithm, you can't get better than one by square root t. <laughs> so I have an algorithm which gets you one by square root t. If you like to optimize the constant factors, <laughs> yeah, uh, you can follow up on this one. Yeah, I don't have lower bounds to say these are the constant factors, but maybe something from Gary VA will inspire you to do a lower bound and get it right. Yeah. You have any other questions? Okay, let's uh, thank our speaker again. Yeah.